if we want to know something about what it means to be human, if we really want to know how to create transformative experience, the arts is a place to look for how to do so. The acts of art making and receiving are social. They're interactive and they're interpersonal. They are a way to share our stories and to bridge our narratives. I believe the future of creativity in the art context is in curating exhibits that open the space to be inclusive, relational, and communicative so we can really feel our interconnectedness. These are the types of meaningful experiences that can transform our perceptions of ourself and others. Step with me into an art viewing situation. Imagine that we're in the museum and we walk into the modern wing and hanging on the walls are abstract artwork and there's wall text and it includes the artist's name, the year, the medium, maybe a title that's often just a description of the content of the image. And you may hear someone exclaim, or quite possibly it's you, my child could do this, what is this doing in a museum? And this is the comment that a friend of mine said to me as we were approaching a Mondrian. And I paused to consider that he and I were having a very different experience of this painting. And I really wanted to understand what was happening here. And conveniently, there was a bench right at the perfect viewing angle to the Mondrian, so we took a seat. And I will say that during our discussion, he had what he considers an aha moment. It was a moment of insight. He got it. His perception of this piece was transformed. It went from, this is stupid, I don't get it, it's meaningless, what is it doing in a museum, to sincere appreciation, understanding it, and the openness to engage with modern artwork differently. Now, if we take a look at these criticisms, on the surface, they seem to be a comment on the perceived lack of the artist's skill. But that's just not the case that abstract artists lack skill. Here we see a representational composition and an abstract work that's created by the same artist. There's also empirical evidence that participants can reliably judge the skill of abstract artists. So Howley, Dolan, and Winner paired a work by an abstract expressionist with a work that was created by a child or an animal. And they were matched in color, line, brushstroke, medium. And what they found is that their participants could reliably tell which piece was created by the professional and which was created by the animal. They consistently rated the work by the professional as more skillful and they preferred it more even when it was mislabeled. It was also a wonderful coincidence that my friend made his comment as we were approaching a Mondrian. At the time, when I started my research, we were studying preferences, and myself and other camps of scientists were creating altered versions of Mondrian compositions by shifting the lines, maybe changing the orientation by rotating the canvas, or changing the colored areas of a composition. Some researchers even tracked eye movements as participants explored the canvas. And overall, what was found is participants liked the original versions more than the altered versions. And if you take a look at the difference in the scan paths, for the original version, the scan path is smoother, it's more exploratory, the artist positioned the elements in such a way to guide the participant movements to explore more of the composition. Researchers call this visual 
brightness. And it's the best organization of the pictorial elements. So what we see here is that artists are able to create visually right designs with identifiable skill, but the findings of several studies show that viewers who are non-trained in the arts really don't like abstract art. And this is a social science finding that replicates. If we take a closer look at, this, at these criticisms, really if we listen to these criticisms, they come with an emotional charge. And understanding what's underlying these emotions or which emotions these are can help us understand how a viewer is engaging with a piece and what we need to create a more positive aesthetic experience. Sylvia and Brown have argued that anger can be a negative aesthetic emotion. And emotions are a reaction to how we are appraising a situation. And so anger has a particular appraisal structure. It will result if we A, believe that our goals or values are being violated, and B, that we feel that this is intentional. And if we think back to my friend with the Mondrian, he didn't get it. His goal was to make meaning. And he may have felt like this goal had been intentionally violated. I believe that we make meaning or we attempt to make meaning in art because we perceive it as a form of communication. And artists seem to be aware of this when they're creating. We have evidence of artists using communicative terms when they describe their process. I think viewers enter into an art viewing scenario with the implicit awareness that this object was created by another human being. So they interact with it as they would another human being, which means look for connection, seek common ground, and to communicate. It may be that entering an art viewing situation is almost like entering into a conversation with the artist through the artwork itself. And if we consider that the way we make meaning in art is similar to the way we make meaning in spoken utterances, we can take an already existing model of verbal communication and map it onto artistic communication. And that's what I've done with the Gricean model. Grice's model is an intentionalist model, which means that the speaker and listener come into the situation with the intent to be understood and to arrive at some form of meaning. And Grice called this the cooperative principle. And if the cooperative principle is met, there are four maxims that follow, and they are quality, quantity, relation, and manner. Now importantly, these maxims can be adhered to, but they can also be uh, intentionally non-fulfilled, or it's still cooperatively being non-fulfilled. And both of these allow a listener to infer meaning from the speaker. If these maxims are violated, it is um, assumed that the speaker is no longer being cooperative, uh, negative emotions can arise and the conversation will cease. This is very similar to what happens when we're not able to make meaning in visual art. Neg negative aesthetic emotions arise and people stop looking. So it's possible that viewers see abstract art as violating communication principles. So I'd like to take you through a little bit of how I uh, translated these maxims to fit in artistic communication. And if we look at the maxim of quality, it's the maxim of truthfulness. So 
does the artist represent reality as is or have they chosen the appropriate materials to represent that thought, idea, or emotion? So if we take uh, an artist wants to represent the horror of war, for instance, they may choose to use heavy, dark materials like charcoal as opposed to watercolor or pastels. The maximum of quantity relates to the amount of information within the composition. Is there enough information here for me to make this meaningful? And if we look at the minimalist painting here by Mangold, we could see that a non-trained viewer might think this is a violation of the communication principle. Relation, does the artwork depict something I can relate my personal experience to, or is this image relevant to the arts as a discipline? And then finally, we have the maxim of manner, which is more about the organization of what is said, and in art viewing context could be visual rightness. So I conducted a couple of studies and what we found is that the more it's perceived that these maxims are fulfilled, the more an artwork is liked. And if we look at representational art, there's no difference between artists and non-artists in the degree to which they feel these maxims are being fulfilled and how much they like the artwork. So representational art may communicate clearly by adhering to communication principles. If we look at abstract art, what we see is artists and non-artists differences. So not only do non-artists um, see the maxims as being less fulfilled, they like the artwork less than artists do. And again, this could be due to perceiving violations of these principles. So if my goal is to, in an art viewing context is to make meaning, to communicate, and I feel like that goal has been intentionally violated, it's not surprising that the resulting emotion could be anger. But what I think is accompanying that anger potentially is a feeling of alienation. Not being able to understand artwork akin to being left out of a conversation. So what could be the museum's role in opening up the conversation to more people? Well, they could deliver the com communicative intent. In a study that I conducted, when participants thought an artist created a work that was meant for someone like them to appreciate, they liked the image more. And not surprisingly, participants thought that representational art was created with this intent more so than abstract art. So the museum can change the wall text information and make it more relational and inclusive. Another way is by curating exhibits around what is intended to be communicated. There was an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City where an artist was the curator. And this exhibit was created in the spirit of a rebus puzzle, which meant that each image was made more meaningful by, in the context of the other images. So we have a display of rocks, a crumpled up piece of paper, a photograph of scissors. Alone, these pieces could be seen as violating communication principles. However, taken together, it's a creative and playful way to call up childhood memories of the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. In his book, Jeffrey Smith discusses the museum effect and it's described as this transformative experience that people have upon leaving the museum. And I think this is a label for what happened with my friend in the Mondrian that day. I think when participants 
when are viewing art that they're able to make meaningful, what they're doing is they're connecting their experience to others across time and across space. They're accessing their common humanity. Now, viewer and artist may have their own unique experiences of joy or loss, for instance, but we've all experienced joy and loss. And I think it's this accessing of our common humanity that allows us to co-construct meaning. The future of creativity is curating more experiences of interconnectedness, and that is beautiful. Thank you.